households have against idiosyncratic shock. So we, we see that, for example, consumption responds to idiosyncratic income changes. We see that consumption responds to anticipated income changes. And th these kinds of data have led to the development of a large set of incomplete market models. And many of these models focus on self-insurance. Okay, so households just have access to some savings to provide insurance. But some aspects of the data say suggest, you know, some aspects of the microdata suggest that households have more insurance than that. Some aspects of the microdata suggest households have less insurance than that. And so the question that I'm sort of interested in is what do all of these issues mean for the dynamics of aggregate consumption data? Okay. So the analysis that I'm gonna that I'm performing here is kind of partially integrating two literatures. Okay, so incomplete markets models are attractive and there's sort of a necessity for discussing this question about what types of households have. And so we like the micro foundation. So they're not really in the standard toolkit of empirical macro. Okay, and so when I when I say that, what I'm sort of have in mind is that for representative agent models we have these formal methods of interpreting time series data. And in in this approach, you kind of load up the model with lots of, of shocks that create a rich covariant structure for observable data. And then you judge the model based on the sort of full range of the empirical implications of the model. Okay? And so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to use these methods that have been applied for representative agent models to interpret the impl empirical implications of an incomplete markets model. Okay? So I'm going to apply this technology to, to think about the joint dynamics of consumption, labor income, and employment conditions. And I kind of come away with three main conclusions. So the first is that the sort of what I would sort of roughly call the standard incomplete markets model fits the data much better than the full insurance representative agent model. The second conclusion is that allowing for partial insurance against skill shocks leads to an even better fit. And this is sort of complements what people have found in panel data. It seems like households have some measure of partial insurance. And then the third thing is that if I extend the model in a slightly crude way, but so that it generates sort of strong responses to consumption from fiscal stimulus payments, for example, it doesn't actually fit the data any better. Okay. So, yes. Uh, let's just have Mark between a question and a comment. Um, the word insurance in this context, I think, is very confusing uh, and somewhat confused. Uh, uh, my uh, way of parsing things is to make a distinction between essentially a permanent income hypothesis kind of a framework where you are on your own and there's no invisible um, mechanism that compensates you for bad things that happen to you. Once you take into account what you would actually measure in your own so that's the sort of a permanent income approach. And then the, 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 insur the word insurance is sort of implicated in all of this, coming from sort of complete markets where all idiosyncratic funds are insured. I think the most deeply confused term is self-insurance. Um, so let, let me go through this slide, and then I think it'll be very clear exactly what I mean by, by this term of insurance. Okay? So, so the, the model is quite simple. So that households have standard preferences, the standard budget constraints. Okay? Um, so Y here is their income when they have their idiosyncratic states of some employment, employed, unemployed, and some skill level S. Okay? Now, this is like the crucial thing in some ways. So this is how your idiosyncratic states map into your sort of take-home income. And this is like a stand-in for all of the markets, informal mechanisms, government programs that try to smooth out employment and skill shops. Okay? So look right here. So this is the sort of, uh, if you would call it, I'll just to use misused language, I'll call it your pre-tax income, is whether or not you're employed times the aggregate wage times your skill level. So then integrating across households, this gives us aggregate income. And now, this is sort of a function that maps your individual states into what you get in your take-home income. And so this BU is kind of like a replacement rate. How much does your take-home depend on your employment status? This BS is somehow parameterizing how much your take-home 
depends on your skill level. Okay? And the denominator just normalizes all of that. Okay? So now if we set both of these B parameters, parameters to zero, there's no insurance in the sense that what you get is just the aggregate wage times your employment status times your skill. If we set all of these parameters to one, these two parameters to one, then everyone gets an equal share of aggregate income. And by varying these parameters, we can sort of go midway between those two extremes. Right? So that's so what I would call in some sense self-insurance would be this case where households are just going to be using this asset to smooth their consumption. What I would call full insurance is this case. So in the model, there are four there are four aggregate shocks. Okay. So the log wage is driven by a trend growth rate, an aggregate persistent technology shock, and a transitory shock. So when I take this to the data, I'm going to think about after tax and transfer labor income in the aggregate. And so this, this transitory shock can potentially stand in for some short-lived, say, changes in taxes or transfers. Okay? So these are one, two shocks. Now, the labor market is driven by a job finding rate and a job separation rate. So these are just the probabilities where you move into and out of unemployment. And these are just AR1s with some mean rates. Okay? And I'm going to assume that all of these shock processes are normal, normally distributed. Okay? So now, the idiosyncratic shocks, there are two. There's the employment state and the skill state. So the skill, I'm going to choose a highly dispersed set of skills. And these skill process, I'm going to match to the autocorrelation and dispersion of wages and to some features of the distribution of wealth. So there's only these two states, employed and this other thing, S, which reflects how much you get paid when you work. Okay? And now those transitions are connected. Okay? So you're more likely to become unemployed if you're in this low skill group. Okay? So just as we see in unemployment by education. So so now, I'll give you an overview of the methods. Okay? So I'm not really like, inventing new methods. It's just applying existing methods here. So, so the first step is to solve the model using this approach to incomplete markets models developed by Michael Ryder. Okay? And the result of this, this is sort of a large linear state space representation of the aggregate economy. Okay? The second step is to turn that into like a small or medium scale representation of the aggregate economy using techniques for model reduction for linear models. Okay? And then at that stage, we have the model sort of just in the mathematical form that we already use to analyze representative agent models. Okay? And so then we can go on, compute the likelihood with the common filter, do anything we want that builds off that linear state space form. So now I'll show you a little more details about these different steps. So many of you might be familiar with this writer method. I'll just give you a quick overview. So you take the continuous objects or the, the continuous objects from the model, so the distribution of wealth and the savings policy rules, and you discretize them. So the distribution of wealth becomes a histogram with many bins. So I have six different types of households and 500 bins for each you know, 500 asset levels for each type of household. So there's 3,000 bins total. Then the policy rules are parameterized with splines with 100 knots for each type of household. You can write down this sort of discrete representation of the economy as this vector x, and you can write down the equations that govern how the economy evolves as a linear system, or sorry, a nonlinear system where eta are some expectational errors. Then you can linearize that, and Writer has a sort of automatic differentiation algorithm to do that. And then you solve that with a linear rational expectation solver like Sims's Gensys type algorithm. Okay? And so what you have at the end is a large system that's expressed in this form. Okay? And then what we want to observe, like aggregate consumption growth, aggregate income growth, unemployment rates, are just el particular elements of this x vector. And we can have some observation matrix that selects out what we want to observe. Okay? So that's because the way the economy evolves depends on this, this individual decision rule that depends on their assets. 
and the spline is internal. No, no, okay, so the solution, the resulting solution is nonlinear with respect to individual states and linear with respect to aggregate states. <laughs> What does with this linear spine business and where you have this lumpiness where you said that if the minimum wealth level is given by say ten thousand dollars, then how does this transition this insight with your decision rule translate that into where you put somebody wealth level? So then you can split their assets sort of evenly between the two buckets so to preserve aggregate assets. So I don't want to spend too much time, because this is really writer's paper, which is published, and I, I don't really want to make that the focus here. So then the next step is to take this large system and reduce it to a scale that's manageable for statistical analysis, okay? So the logic of this, this is again not new, this is, there's a large literature in sort of operations research on reducing linear systems. But the logic is that most of this vector x is not needed to predict the dynamics of what we're trying to observe. Aggregate consumption, aggregate income, stuff like that, okay? And so there's dimensions in which this x varies, that, does not, that x does not really vary, so we don't really need to track that dimension of the state space. There's dimensions in which variation doesn't really show up in what we're trying to observe, so we don't really need to track that dimension of the state space, okay? And so, there's techniques where you can identify which dimensions of the state space you don't really need to keep, keep track of and eliminate them. And there's explicit bounds on the accuracy of these reduced systems. Okay? So this is all very easy to implement with the MATLAB system control toolbox. Okay? And now the last step is to apply all of the technology that's been developed for DSGE models. So the likelihood function is something that people focus on a lot because it's the basis of maximum likelihood and Bayesian estimation procedures. And it's easy to compute that, you know, given that I've assumed normally distributed shocks, we have a linear system, normal shocks, you apply the common filter, you get the, the likelihood function. Another measure of fit of the model that I like is Watson's measure of fit. And the way to think about this is that there's some discrepancy between the autocovariances of the model and the data. And Watson asks, what's the smallest measurement error or residual that you could put on the model to match the data exactly in these dimensions? And then you report how big is this measurement error relative to the data variance. So it's, it's akin to one minus the R squared from a regression. It's the, the residual sum of squares over the the data sum of squares, okay? Okay, so just a little bit about good and bad things about this particular method, okay? Or this collection of methods. So the writer algorithm extends very easily to having general equilibrium. The model I'm showing you here is partially equilibrium, but it's, you know, writer's paper is a GE paper. Um, and it's easily extended to sort of complex aggregate features like nominal rigidities, which is something else that I've worked on with Ricardo Reis. Okay. Um, but maybe the most important thing is that this writer method easily allows for a lot of aggregate shocks, a lot of persistent aggregate shocks. Okay. And that's important in this empirical context where people like to load up their models with lots of persistent shocks to get this rich covariance structure. So the Smets and Routers model, for example, has seven persistent aggregate shocks. Okay. And then the last thing is that it results in this linear form that's very convenient for this statistical analysis. So that, those are the advantages. The disadvantage is that it's based on sort of a perturbation around the stationary economy without aggregate shocks and therefore may lose accuracy if you move far from the steady state. So at the end of the talk today I'll, I'll show you a little bit of an investigation into the accuracy of the method. So the data that I'm going to ask the model to explain are from 1966 to 2012, and we're going to have consumption of non-durables and services, labor income net of taxes and transfers, a measure of short-term unemployment, and a measure of long-term unemployment. By separating between short-term and long-term, that allows me to identify separately job finding rates and job separation rates. And so the consumption and income are real per capita and in growth rates. Okay. So 
So let me just show you a little bit about the parameterization of the economy. So this, this is what I'm going to call the low insurance economy, where there's a low level of insurance against unemployment risk and no insurance against skill risk. Okay. Um, is that point two like the replacement rate? So you could, that's the way to think about it, yeah. Um, this stuff is pretty standard. Let me talk about this. This is important. So we have these four aggregate shocks that are driving the economy, and I needed to choose the parameters of those processes. So I take the equations of the model that relate to the income process, forget the consumption stuff, and I estimate by maximum likelihood the parameters of these processes. Okay, so that's where the driving processes come from. Okay. So I'll take you, ultimately I'm going to show you things like the likelihood, but I want to give you a sense of what's driving the results in the model. So, so this is the impulse response showing the low insurance economy that I just showed you to a full insurance economy with, with those two parameters set to one. And you see that there's a, quite a large difference between the two imp sets of impulse responses. So after, say, a job finding, increase in the job finding rate, the, the full insurance economy does not respond very much, and consumption is like a random walk here. So this is 100 times the log change in consumption. In consumption, yeah. Um, so you get these these hump-shaped dynamics. I think is coming from the evolution of the log distribution of wealth. E. So you see here that in response to a transitory shock, you get a pretty big impact effect on impact, and then it dies out. And so this is potentially explained by the existence of constrained households. But really, the most important thing that you'll see in these figures is just the magnitudes of the responses are very different. So we can look at a set of moments from, from the economies. And so you see here, this is a crucial thing that's going on. The variance of the low insurance economy is much bigger than the variance of consumption growth in the full insurance economy. And the, it's not as much as the data, but it's bringing us substantially closer, okay? Consumption growth is negatively correlated with short-term unemployment in the data. The model with low insurance is able to sort of get some negative correlation, but it's quite low still. The full insurance economy, unemployment is really about how is, is income divided among the population in some way, doesn't matter so much. And then the next thing is that the autocorrelation of consumption growth is quite strong in the data. It's zero in the full insurance economy. It's positive, about 0.1 in the low insurance economy. So by looking at these moments, you would say it looks like this low insurance economy has some features that recommend it, right? Now, one useful way of comparing the full set of second moments of a model and data is to plot the spectral density and the spectral density matrices, okay? And so the spectral density, if you integrate under it, you get the variance of the process, the unconditional variance. And so it shows you how the variance, the total variance is coming from different frequencies, okay? And in the data, you see that it has this decreasing shape, so that it has more power at low frequencies than at high frequencies, okay? So this is gonna be familiar to you in the context of like, declining personal savings rates or growing share of consumption and aggregate income. Okay? It's like low, low moving things, in, slow moving things in consumption. And we see that the, the incomplete markets model is able to get something of that declining shape. So that's one thing. It's also much higher than the full insurance economy. Reflect just a mirror, mirroring that higher variance that we showed in the previous slide. Okay? So, no insurance. So I didn't go that far because I don't want to deal with people having no income, but so I don't know. I don't know. I would well, I'll come to I'll come to varying the insurance parameters in a few slides and you might be able to extrapolate from that. I'm kind of how much time do I have? Fifteen minutes. Okay. So the full wait. So no insurance mean, meaning that you can't amount. Is that what you mean? I don't know. 
So, so this is useful in an intermediate step towards getting to the likelihood function, because the likelihood function in the time domain is very closely approximated by the distance between this line and this line in some general sense. Like, not just these two lines, but the whole spectral density matrices, okay? So one way of comparing this distance from the data to the model is to use Watson's measure of fit, which is basically saying, how much measurement error do I need to stick here to get the two to match? And then it's different for each frequency, and we can just average it across frequencies. Okay? So according to that measure, the variance of the measurement error you would need to attach to consumption growth to match the data is 60% of the variance of the data in the low insurance economy and 90% of the variance of the data in the full insurance economy. Okay? You, uh, the income processes give very similar results. So the, the estimated processes for the income process are the same in the two insurance schemes and they fit pretty well as you can see. Okay, okay so to get to, to calculate a likelihood function we need to make sure the model is not stochastically singular. A stochastically singular model is where the model implies a covariance matrix for the observables that's singular. And so there's maybe things that's going on with the data that the model just can't explain. Okay? That would happen, for instance, if you have fewer shocks than observable variables. Okay? It's not strictly the case here in the sense that we have the same number of observables and shocks, but there's no shock that's really just moving consumption directly. What we have is two shocks that are moving the wages at different, in different ways. So we want to add something that's going to kind of be able to summarize the movements in consumption that are not captured by the model. Okay? Now one approach in the literature is to load up the model with all kinds of structural shocks. Sometimes those are very difficult to interpret. So if I put in a shock to the Euler equation, like a patient's shock, that would give you volatility and consumption growth directly. Okay? But would we say we understood consumption growth? No. We would just say there's some residual, really. And so an equivalent way of thinking about that is to add measurement error to consumption growth. Okay? Well, it's not equivalent, but it's a similar way of thinking about it. Is I'm going to add to the model measurement error on consumption growth. Okay? Now, I don't view explaining consumption growth as resulting from measurement error as a success. Okay? So I want to sort of like penalize the measurement error in the model. So, so this table shows the likelihood of the data at different standard deviations of the measurement error. Okay? So now, if we, allow, if we allow ourselves to choose whatever measurement error we want, okay, we get very similar likelihoods regardless of the insurance scheme. Why is that? That's because in this figure, adding IID measurement error to consumption is just raising this red line uniformly. Okay? And you're going to raise it up, and it's going to fit nicely. You're going to add measurement error to the blue line, it's going to raise it up, and it's going to fit nicely. Okay? So, but this is kind of like the feature of the model that's really maybe allowing us to distinguish between the two insurance schemes. So, so what I do is I say, well, I really don't want to explain the model through measurement error, and I'm going to penalize that by, you could almost say, I'm going to have a strong prior that measurement error should be small. Okay? And so if we look at small measurement errors, you see that the low insurance economy gives a likelihood that's much higher. Okay? So that's consistent with the other sort of results I've been showing you. So now, what about other forms of insurance, different combinations of these B parameters? So, so I've just tried a whole range of different combinations, and the one that seems to work best is where you have half of your skill shocks are insured in some sense, so that beta S is equal to 0.5, DS is 0.5, but you still have this low degree of insurance against unemployment. Yes? The, you, so you're parameterizing the microeconomic uh, income process following you can't 
change the B parameter and leave the dynamics of household level income unchanged, right? I mean, if you introduced an unemployment insurance system, that would change the dynamics of micro right. uh, income. And then the so so in some sense, you need to know under what regime of insurance was the data from Heathcote and DuPage estimated, right? Yes and no. I kind of agree and I kind of disagree. So, so it's true. What I've done is I've parameterized the income process for that low insurance economy to match the wealth data. And now I'm going to start changing the income process and that's going to have implications for the wealth data. And so if you plug in these different insurance parameters, the model is not going to match the distribution of wealth in the same way it did that I calibrated to. Okay, and so I think that's what is it's like really what I'm saying. What I'm saying is the income process itself, the microeconomic idiosyncratic uninsurable shocks, or estimating. No, I'm not changing that. I know, but you, you should. Is my point. So if I don't you want change to. B, that changes that. You know, and they through and that's because it's through this this mapping through the distribution of wealth, right? Like they. No, work. no, it's directly. It affects income. Yeah, but they measure income. So that let me let me give you a different way of thinking about it. So we all have. We're all living in our, in our low insurance economy. And then your kid gets sick. And so you take your assets and you give some consumption to the kid. And so it looks, it looks the same for the asset positions, the income processes. It looks the same, but you're still feeding your kid. And, and so the fact that we don't match that data exactly, I feel it does not preclude that there being some kind of insurance schemes that prevent no, consumption. My, my point is much simpler. Suppose they looked at the micro data uh, in a world that had little unemployment insurance and they estimated the parameters of their process. Uh, and then they estimated the parameters of that process in a world where there was a lot of unemployment insurance, let's say. Uh, the parameters would differ because they're looking at income after the insurance. But so what I'm saying is that this insurance does not need to be measured in this PSI I know, but most, but an awful lot of it is. So it's always a sort of magical mystery insurance that yeah. you're, you're, you're calling it unemployment insurance. But I don't want to, I don't want to take that stand too seriously. So, I mean, I kind of take your point that like, that's what I've done. And if you're going to say this has different implications for the microdata, yeah. I kind of agree, but this is what I've done. So what, what makes the most sense in terms of fitting the aggregate data is to think that skill shocks are partially insurable. And so I was thinking about why is this? And I was thinking that there's kind of a trade-off. This incomplete markets aspect gets us like this constraint to get consumption to respond to current income, but it also means that the people who are in these kind of constrained situations have actually very few resources and don't affect the aggregate consumption that much. So there's kind of a trade-off between like blowing up the inequality and magnifying that incompleteness aspect and actually giving more resources to the people who are going to be acting in this constrained way. So I think that's why it's not obvious which way it goes. The, the unemployment insurance, it seems that having less gives a better fit to the aggregate data. Okay? So you can go to the next slide. So, so the third thing that I wanted to investigate is this sort of discussion about, well, the model, the standard model doesn't match the data on how consumption responds to fiscal stimulus payments. And Kaplan and Violante have proposed that if a model that with illiquid assets can match that data, okay? So I'm gonna incorporate their idea in a crude way. I'm gonna say there's a quadratic adjustment cost to adjusting household assets. So I don't wanna introduce a second continuous state variable for the liquid and illiquid assets. But I'm just gonna say household assets are less useful for insuring against income fluctuations because it's costly to move them around, okay? And so then I'm gonna calibrate the model, this adjustment cost, so that when I run the Johnson et al. fiscal stimulus payments experiment in simulated data, I get a rebate coefficient of 0.25. Okay, and they find 0.2 to 0.4, okay? So now, these are the impulse responses 
with the baseline low insurance economy and this adjustment cost economy, okay? And you see there's a big difference in the way the economy responds to the transitory shock. Much more response with the adjustment cost of consumption growth to the transitory shock of consumption. But these other more persistent shocks respond quite similarly with or without the adjustment cost. And if you think about that, here you want to save, you know, this is a very transitory shock. You want to save a lot of the income in an ideal world. And the adjustment cost really stymies you a lot. These are much more persistent shocks in some sense. And so they would have a, a smaller impact on household savings. And the adjustment cost would affect you much less. So now, if we consider how these models fit with and without the adjustment cost, we get different impressions based on what we look at, but overall they look quite similar, okay? So we see that consumption volatility is increased by the adjustment cost. We see that the Watson measure of fit prefers the adjustment cost a little bit, but the likelihood prefers the model without the adjustment cost. So this might be saying that this, this extra volatility is not really showing up in the right relation to the other series, okay? And that's why the likelihood is lower here. Okay, so for, for you guys, I thought I had to say something about accuracy. So, so what I did was I stripped down the model and solved it non-linearly. And then I wanna compare just simulated data from this writer approach to the non-linear solution, okay? Um, so these are like the simplifications. I want to get rid of some of the aggregate shocks. Uh, and I want to have an income process. In, my, in the model I showed you, the unemployment across skill groups is a state variable. Get rid of that. Just say you get 30% of your income if you're unemployed. Okay? There's no pooling. Okay, so we're going to solve the model nonlinearly, solve it, and see what happens. And I'm going to show you writer before and after this model reduction. So just to get rid of that, in this whole table, there's no difference between writer and writer reduced, okay? So that model reduction doesn't seem to be very important. And now, in many respects, the not fully nonlinear and the writer solution give you a, a similar picture. There's a few things that I'll point to where they're somewhat different. So here, this is 0.233, this is 0.263, okay? So this consumption volatility, you know, it, there's some discrepancy, but this is pretty, I would say, it doesn't really change the way you would view the data versus the model, okay, or the two models that I was showing you. Um, and then here, in this first order autocorrelation, it's slightly higher in the, the nonlinear solution than in the writer solution. But overall, oh, and this was the third one, the, the correlation of consumption growth with the short-term unemployment is slightly more negative in the nonlinear. So I was thinking, what would be the standard way of solving this model and simulating data and calculating moments? It would be to yeah, solve it. Okay, so I, maybe I shouldn't use the, the word accuracy. I would say comparison of approaches to more established approaches. Actually, put right down the graph, or put down the graph of the decision rules okay. from the different solutions. Yeah. And now if the decision rules are the same decision rules, then all these numbers, you don't need to compute these numbers. Sure, so I mean, I can show you that graph and you can see they're not exactly the same, right? But there are some differences. I like to look at it in this way because this is what I care about in some way at the end. It's like, I'm gonna simulate the model and, I, and this is what I'm gonna use to judge the models and am I gonna get the same impression if I do it one way or the other, okay? So, but yeah, there's other ways and maybe more sophisticated ways of thinking about that. Okay, so to wrap up, so we can now do this sort of full information analysis of incomplete markets models using all of the tools or many of the tools of this DSGE literature. And I've found that this incomplete markets assumption really makes a better fit to the aggregate data. And it's slightly improved by allowing for some partial insurance against skill shock. This microevidence on the response of transitory, of consumption to these transitory income shocks 
is maybe not a reason to discard the incomplete markets model as a general model of consumption dynamics. But if you're interested in particular of how the economy is going to respond to a transitory income shock, then it does matter. Okay? Okay. So thanks a lot.